All right. Uh, so debt relief during COVID-19. This is joint work with uh, Susan Cherry, who is a PhD student at Stanford, Erica Jiang at USC, Gregor Matvos at Northwestern, and Tomek Piskorsky at Columbia. So what do we do in this paper? The motivation is pretty straightforward. There's been an ongoing debate about various stimulus measures taken after the COVID-19. Uh, most of this debate has been on PPP, stimulus checks, unemployment support, but concurrently, there was a significant amount of consumer debt relief that was passed. Uh, in Great Recession, we know that the nature and extent of this debt relief was significantly related to the recovery. For example, in work with uh, my co-author, uh, Tomaj Piskorski, uh, we looked at debt relief and what kind of effect it had on recovery related to out of sales growth, house price uh, changes, and so on. And what we find is that areas more exposed to debt relief had a significantly better, faster, uh, 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 outcomes, for example, here related to auto sales growth. Uh, so what, what do we sort of want to do here? We want to look at uh, the setting related to CARES Act, where a significant amount of debt relief was passed uh, in, in the entire US. The focus here is going to be on debt forbearance actions, uh, which is postponing loan payments. We want to study them because, like I said, it's quite related to how recovery ultimately happens in these uh, uh, big events like the Great Recession. Uh, what we are going to be sort of interested in this paper is uh, to simply quantify the overall level of uh, uh, forbearance. Uh, we want to understand the target uh, who benefits from this, both in terms of individuals and regions. We want to understand what the role of government mandates is as far as these forbearance actions are concerned, because forbearance doesn't only happen with the government, it also happens in the private sector. Uh, this was a very simple debt relief program relative to the programs that were passed in the Great Recession. Uh, but yet there is a role for intermediaries, so we want to understand that. Why is that the case? And then we want to conclude with some broader implications for debt relief policies as we come out of this forbearance actions that we have seen. Uh, so just to give you a preview of what we are going to find here, uh, we are going to find that there's massive forbearance actions that have happened. Uh, and at the same time, there is a massive forbearance overhang that is uh, right now dragging the economy. So we are talking about $2 trillion of loans which are under forbearance action this amounts to about 60 million US consumers, $70 billion of debt payments as estimated at, uh, as end of quarter, uh, first quarter of 2021 are under forbearance. Uh, we think that this could have significantly dampened the household debt distress channel, which was operative, for example, in the Great Recession. And uh, many have argued uh, led to uh, the Great Recession uh, getting amplified. But we find that the rates are highest in regions uh, with highest COVID rates and with greatest economic decline, which tells us that the target uh, of the program hit the target. Uh, uh, we also find that the private sector provided substantial forbearance, about a quarter of the total forbearance was outside government mandates. Uh, it's a simple program, yet intermediary factors seem to matter. Uh, so just to give you a sense relative to Great Recession, uh, as the cases and the crisis uh, uh, amplified in the US, uh, there was a substantial quick policy response the CARES Act had in its uh, mandate uh, a substantial number of actions in the household sector. Just want to contrast this with the Great Recession, where also there was debt relief passed in the household sector, but it took uh, almost a year, year and a half before uh, these debt relief programs were ultimately passed. This was a substantially quick response, as can be seen with the cases and where CARES Act came in. So what did the CARES Act have? It had uh, these things which we'll study related to uh, forbearance measures. So these forbearance measures affected different parts of the consumer debt market. Uh, the government-backed mortgages, which is two-thirds of the mortgage markets, were clearly affected. Here, the idea is that the borrowers need to request forbearance. There was also forbearance in the student loan market. Here, it was automatic. Every loan uh, uh, was automatically placed in forbearance. And then the mandates did not affect other parts of the consumer debt market, like auto and revolving debt. Uh, and the important thing for us is that loan forbearance is not reported as delinquent in the credit bureau uh, reports, which we'll be relying on. So what's the setting? Setting is, as, as should be clear, related to the crisis uh, and the CARES Act. We are going to be looking at debt forbearance actions in the $14 trillion U.S. consumer market. Uh, this covers mortgages, student, auto debt, and revolving loans. Uh, the data is Equifax data that we'll be relying on. It's a representative random sample. So we have roughly 20 million consumers that we'll be tracking. There are 300 credit outcomes. The consumers are randomized based on their social security number. So we can aggregate very quickly by multiplying by a factor. Uh, we are also going to be looking at regional economic conditions using Zillow data, BLS, census, 
opportunity tracker using the opportunity uh, insight team. Uh, the Equifax data in particular is going to be very useful because we are going to be able to track the forbearance action on each loan. And uh, what is interesting is whatever we find from Equifax data actually matches what the servicers directly report, which we are able to verify uh, in the paper. So what's the first uh, headline result that I want to show you? The headline result is that if you look at in this picture, uh, how the unemployment rate has moved and how the delinquency rate has moved, there has been a substantial one-on-one -on -one movement uh, in terms of how delinquency spikes when unemployment rates spike, except the recent pandemic, which is shown uh, uh, around the dotted line. The unemployment rates spiked tremendously, but delinquency rates didn't. And the answer where these delinquencies disappeared is in the right picture, which plots the forbearance. So right at that time, forbearance spiked. And that's basically the first, red line, uh, first headline result that we have, that there's a large increase in forbearance rate relative to Great Recession. And we think it can account for the low delinquency rate that you see despite record unemployment. And why is this important? Because it could have significantly dampened the household debt distress channel. So one can do this in a more sophisticated manner where one tries to predict what the delinquencies would have been based on an estimated model, which relies on unemployment, individual characteristics, house price changes, and so on. And we sort of do that uh, in the left uh, picture here. The lowest line is what the actual delinquency rates are, and the other lines are just telling you what the predicted delinquency rates would be based on an estimated model with different kinds of uh, uh, robustness and uh, uh, done. And what you find is delinquency rates would have been much higher given whatever the trends were based on estimated model. And what does uh, this sort of reflect? Well, it reflects that most of these delinquencies have gone in forbearance uh, where uh, the forbearance rate is plotted on the right-hand side. Uh, so this was just looking at mortgages, which is the largest part of the consumer debt market. But this sort of pattern of forbearance increasing uh, is true in student debt market, is true in auto debt market, is true in revolving debt market all around the CARES Act. Now, student, the levels might be different. For example, in the student debt, we are seeing that almost the entire market under the for forbearance because that's the nature of how the mandates were passed. Whereas in auto debt and revolving debt, the levels are different. I'll get back to this variation across debt types very briefly. If you look across the regions, uh, there is huge amount of heterogeneity. But what is very clear is if you look at mortgages, auto debt and revolving debt, there is huge dispersion in the country with the darker red significant more, more forbearance. But in student debt, it's spread equally roughly because it's automatic like I mentioned earlier. Now, in terms of some headline statistics that you should sort of take away, uh, there are a couple. The first, if you look at a majority of borrowers in forbearance, about 70% uh, in forbearance actually have missed payments but 30% do not miss pay payments. So what that means is, even though they take forbearance, they actually keep making payments. So it's almost like a credit line for them. Uh, in terms of what's the largest relief debt category, not surprisingly, mortgages and auto debt, which is where most of the debt is. Uh, if you look at the aggregation, uh, what you find is that about $70 billion estimated at the end of quarter one, 2021, uh, in different categories is under forbearance. This is about 60 million consumers. Uh, by any metric, this is significant amount of debt relief, uh, even relative to the other COVID-19 stabilization programs, uh, 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 if you sort of compare them. Next, what we want to sort of do is to look at both the intensive and the extensive margin. Where was the take up and conditional on take up? What was forbearance like? So what we do first is stratify the uh, distribution based on income, which is on the left, and on the credit score, which is on the right, and ask where is the forbearance take up more? And not surprisingly, what you find is less credit worthy and lower income folks get forbearance uh, at a higher rate. And you see similar patterns. This is for mortgages, but you see similar patterns for other debt types, except student debt, which like I have mentioned is automatic. So it doesn't really depend on anything of these, these things. I said that this is not surprising. Uh, there is a little bit of a surprising element here in the sense that this seems pretty well targeted relative to some other programs, for instance. Uh, you can also ask that condition on forbearance, where is uh, the, the intensive margin here? And you do the same sort of exercise stratifying on income on the left and credit score on the right. And what you find is in contrast to what I showed you earlier, conditional on take up, higher income borrowers get much larger dollar of forbearance per individual. This is not surprising because it reflects higher loan balances. And when you sort of quantify this, what you find is about 61% of financial relief due to forbearance is going to higher income individuals. Uh, so 
to summarize in terms of targeting borrowers based on their higher financial uh, vulnerability and credit worthiness got a lot of forbearance but in terms of dollars borrowers with higher pre-pandemic income received a significant relief now i want to contrast this with the diff different kind of programs that happen for example stimulus checks now stimulus checks just target based on income this is a more refined program if you will so if you plot it regionally on the y-axis where is the dollar per adult in terms of stimulus money and on the x-axis the same thing with forbearance what you find is that forbearance is going in different regions relative to stimulus not surprisingly because stimulus only targets income and i just showed you that even higher income individuals got forbearance debt relief now is that the only variation that's not uh, it regionally we can sort of see uh, that forbearance tends to go in most vulnerable parts of the population with respect to the uh, pandemic. There is enough research which shows that minority and black were affected more by the pandemic. And in fact, we find that forbearance tends to be larger uh, in regions where the share of minorities and uh, percentage black, for instance, is larger. This is the same sort of pictures that I showed you before. We can also stratify this based on infection rate, unemployment claims, and uh, percentage at risk industries again regionally and you again find that the forbearance tends to be larger in regions where uh, COVID-19 has had a more of an adverse effect. Uh, at this stage then we want to move to the second part of the paper which is looking at forbearance and trying to understand what's the interaction between government and private mandates really, uh, government mandates and private forbearance that has happened. Uh, what, first what we find is that there is a substantial amount of private forbearance about a quarter and what we then want to do is to try and understand uh, uh, using data, what is the relationship between the two? And what we are going to do is to try and exploit variation across debt types. Why? Because some debts, uh, some types of debt do get forbearance, others don't. And we are also going to exploit variation within debt type because within the mortgage sector, for example, some parts of the loans get forbearance through government mandates, others don't. And what does that tell us about this? So the first is me repeating the same picture that I showed you before, but this time highlighting that mortgages and student debt who got forbearance work under the government mandate, but auto and revolving debt weren't. And what this sort of tells you is that the private sector was also responding uh, around the same time in terms of offering forbearance. Can we say more about this? And we can. What we then do is try to exploit within the mortgage sector this idea that part of the loans are eligible for government mandates in terms of forbearance and part are not. So what is the idea? On the left, what I have plotted is the mortgage market and the vertical line tells you conforming, non-conforming split. The left side is conforming, that's under the government mandate. Right side of the vertical line is jumbo loans, which are not under the government mandate. So before COVID, what's been plotted is forbearance rates and they're pretty similar. After COVID, what do you see? you see a substantial increase in forbearance in the entire market, which is consistent with what I showed you before. But if you look at the eligible and ineligible regions, eligible with government mandates and ineligible, what you see is that the government a part of the uh, uh, segment has sees more forbearance than the private segment. So this is something that shows up whether you do this visually or in regressions uh, that the government side, the conforming side of the market sees more forbearance. You can also do this in the more classic different diff setting and uh, you see similar effects. Uh, quantitatively, what you find is that there is a higher forbearance rate on loans with government mandates about 25% higher, but the private sector also is providing a substantial amount of uh, mandates. Uh, the advantage of a different dip setting is you can account for changes in distribution of borrowers and regional characteristics and so on. The last part of the paper then tries to understand what is happening in terms of uh, how the uh, forbearance is being uh, imparted and here i want to sort of focus on the importance of intermediaries for two reasons number one during great recession a lot of debt relief programs have passed they were complex programs related to the program that was just uh, sort of passed related to uh, in, in the cares act because they had verification and pv tests and so on and the intermediary spec uh, specific factors have been shown to significantly affect implementation of this relief so the question then is, we have a very simple debt relief program. There's no verification. Borrowers just need to re request. So do these intermediary factors still matter? The second reason to sort of worry about this is that the uh, intermediation market has seen a substantial change in the last decade with a lot of shadow banking also becoming dominant, both in terms of originating loans and servicing the loans, which is trying to figure out whether the loans are going to be making payments or not. Uh, and that might play a role. 
And indeed, that's what we find. Here is just two cuts of the data to give you a sense. On the left is forbearance rates of banks versus shadow banks. And what it shows you is that banks offer forbearance at much larger, uh, higher rates than shadow banks. And on the right is telling you, if you look at in-house versus outsourced servicing, there is a substantial difference too. What that tells you is that if a bank originates a loan and also services, they are more likely to do forbearance than if they sell the loan to someone in terms of uh, the servicing rights. Uh, uh, those uh, servicers don't tend to do as much forbearance. So intermediary uh, you know, factors still matter. Uh, and in ways that we might expect, uh, you could do it more formally, which is asking the intermediary fixed effects matter for forbearance rates. In the paper, we sort of argue that they do uh, in terms of the usual tests. One visual picture that I'll show you is that not only do they matter, but there seems to be some sort of persistence in terms of what kind of actions intermediaries take. So here is a picture where on the x-axis is pre-pandemic forbearance lender fixed effect, and on the y-axis is post-pandemic forbearance lender fixed effect, where the lender fixed effects is trying to just explain the forbearance rate on loans before and after the pandemic, accounting for a bunch of uh, covariates. And what you see is there is a substantial amount of correlation here, both in terms of banks and shadow banks, which then tells you again that intermediary fixed effects are important and in a very persistent manner. All right, so let me just summarize then what I've shown you. I've shown you that the financial institutions provided a huge amount of debt relief to consumers, about 60 numbers in, that you should keep in mind is 60 million consumers, $70 billion of payments. Not all consumers get uh, uh, forbearance and stop making payments. About a third of those who get forbearance use it as a credit line, not using it. There is a pretty good targeting that the program did in terms of intensive and extensive margin. We think that in absence of forbearance, we would have seen about a 2 million uh, increase in mortgage defaults, which probably tells you why relative to Great Recession, we have seen a stark uh, departure in terms of household debt distress channel not uh, uh, showing up. Uh, private actions rather than uh, just government mandates also account for uh, a substantial portion of the uh, uh, debt relief. And one can ask why was there such an extensive response, especially on the private side? What has changed in the Great Recession? There are two possibilities. One is that maybe the private sector internalized some of the lessons from the Great Recession. But we think more likely it's probably because the nature of the crisis everybody thought is temporary and exogenous aggregate shock, which then tells you that renegotiation of the kind that we are seeing is reasonable to do. Uh, there is a lesson that comes out here already for debt relief policies. If you look at mortgage mandates, borrowers need to request forbearance. What does that result in? Only 10% of the eligible borrowers got relief, but at the same time, the self-selection is such that it seems to be going to less creditworthy and financially vulnerable borrowers. Contrast that with student mandates, where borrowers automatically, all of them got forbearance, and that doesn't seem to result in a targeted debt relief program. So allowing a choice of whether to request debt relief seems to be a reasonable way of thinking about targeted policy, Having said that, there are frictions still that uh, uh, hamper debt relief programs like intermediary factors that we need to understand better. The last concluding uh, comment that I have is that we have a lot of forbearance for overhang. Uh, like I said, about 60 billion uh, 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 of uh, forbearance uh, that we need to worry about. If you think about what are we talking about, we are talking about on average about $1,800 uh, for mortgage borrowers. Uh, this is a substantial part of a borrower's income. Uh, for some borrowers low, in the lower income part of the distribution, we're talking about 80% of their monthly income. So how should we unwind this? Uh, there are different ways in which one want, or we may want to unwind this. If it is structured as one-time payment, uh, that could result in a significant household uh, distress because you're talking about $6,000, $7,000 of accumulated payments for some borrowers as of the end of quarter one of 21. Or you may want to spread it over time. So if you amortize it, given the schedule that we see in the data, what you would find is about $50 in terms of principal balance would be needed to be adjusted to take this into account. Having said that, I mean, this, these are calculations that the government can do too, but this is something that will require a coordinated effort because this is a problem that is not going away in the short term. So thank you very much.